two and a half thousand years ago, a Greek city flourished in a quite spectacular way. Out of this place came extraordinary things, philosophy, theater, and a great political idea. The city was Athens, the idea, democracy. Democracy triumphed briefly, then was forgotten. Yet today we venerate it as the cornerstone of Western civilization. In Washington, the greatest superpower in the world champions Athenian ideals. Liberty, equality, and freedom of speech. But are we really the guardians of Greece's golden age? These perfect white columns seem to me to be a great metaphor for what we've done with the classical past. We've taken the world of the ancient Greeks and we've whitewashed it. We've turned it into a kind of fantasy. We look back at ancient Athens and we see what we want to see, not what was actually going on. I'm going back to ancient Athens to dig deeper, to look at the grit as well as the glory and to discover the true story of democracy. If you say the name Athens, certain images immediately spring to mind. A beautiful Greek vase, enlightened philosophers, the Parthenon. This is a place that we cherish as the first free and equal society, a good, solid basis for our story of democracy. But beneath the Golden Age ideal was a city that constantly voted to go to war and that ruthlessly carved out an empire to enrich itself. A city which championed freedom of speech, but couldn't tolerate criticism from within. And now's the perfect time to dissect the idealized picture of Athenian democracy, because so much has recently been discovered that casts new light on what actually happened here in the Golden Age. Five hundred years before the birth of Christ, three centuries before the rise of Rome, the world was dominated by the great empires of Asia. Europe remained the province of primitive tribes. But this world order stood on the brink of cataclysmic change. A new power, Persia, had swallowed up the great civilizations of the Middle East forming the world's first superpower. The empire of the King of Kings spread from the mouth of the Indus to the gates of Europe. But beyond the borders of this first world empire, a small, dynamic place was making a noise. Wedged between east and west lay a mountainous collection of islands and strips of land, each ruled by one of hundreds of rival city-states. Just one of these was the ancient city of Athens. In the 6th century BC, Athens was dominated by the Acropolis, a jagged fortress of prehistoric limestone, crowned with simple stone structures where the people made sacrifices to their gods. In its shadow was the Agora, the center of the city, where the Athenians came to buy and sell, talk and debate. It was the hub of Athenian life. One of the busiest, noisiest places in the Greek world. It's probably huge private buildings and small sanctuaries and things of that sort. Archaeologists have been excavating this site since the early 1930s. Their basement storerooms are packed with artifacts from 5,000 years of Athenian life. John Camp showed me round. How many artifacts have you got in here? Catalogued one, something like a quarter of a million. And then we keep a great deal of the pottery and fragments because that tells us the date. And down here... The layers of archaeology here show us that Golden Age Athens was built on prehistoric foundations. 
Before it was the Civic Center, it was a burial ground. And so in the Iron Age and Bronze Age, uh, there were lots of tombs. We have several hundred tombs, and so we have the, the remains of various people uh, who were uh, buried here long before this was the center of town. So this is what, about 1,000 BC? Somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 BC. I think we always forget that, that the classical Athenians were, they were walking on the ghosts of the past. You know? Yep, very yeah. definitely. In recent centuries, the Greek states had emerged from a dark age and transformed themselves. Greek shipping now spanned the Mediterranean, making trade with Palestine, Africa, Italy and the Black Sea. These were warrior societies, but the Greeks didn't go in for individual heroics, they fought as one. In massed ranks of soldiers called hoplites, they protected one another with their shields. All across the Greek world, populist military dictators, tyrants, backed by these citizen armies, grabbed power from traditional elites. Ironic that in Athens, the path to democracy was smoothed by tyranny. Tyrannos is a Near Eastern word, which initially referred to relatively benign rulers who were sometimes even supporters of the common people. But as time went by, the Greek tyrants started to live up to the name as we understand it. From the 5th century BC to the present day, tyrant has become synonymous with an abuse of power. By the end of the 6th century, Athens could no longer tolerate the vindictive regime of the tyrants. They were expelled by a group of aristocrats who began fighting amongst themselves. It was this conflict that would help spark democracy. On the one side, Isagoras, backed by Athens' rivals, Sparta. On the other was Cleisthenes, who desperately needed a tactic to counter his enemy's military muscle. Cleisthenes came up with a shocking plan. He appealed to the mob, the rabble, hoi polloi, as they're called in Greek. The historian Herodotus tells us that Cleisthenes welcomed into his faction the ordinary people. If you are a member of the elite, you thought the people were not the people as a whole. It's the masses, it's the unwashed masses, the mob. Democracy was power of the poor people over the rich. Now hope was stalking the streets of Athens. The people had tasted power, and although power is relatively easy to hand out, it is almost impossible to take away. When the aristocrats tried to impose their power, the people rioted and stormed the Acropolis. They overthrew their rulers, and without knowing it or planning it, democracy was born. What had begun as one man's solution to a problem would turn in the next 50 years into a completely new system of government. No one knew that what had been invented was the first direct democracy. At the time of Cleisthenes, the concept didn't even exist. The word democracy comes from demos, people, and kratos, power or grip. Mind you, it caught on pretty quickly. Within a couple of generations, the word was everywhere, and soon the city would worship democracy as a goddess. Democracy is an extraordinary surprise. They didn't replace one set of rulers with another set of rulers, as has happened for thousands of years in the West. They said, no, actually, why don't we try something extraordinary? We can rule ourselves. In a world controlled by kings and cliques, the Athenians created, almost by accident, a remarkable experiment in direct popular rule. And they transformed their city, specially to house the new system. Opposite the Acropolis, people would assemble on the hill of the Pnyx. Any citizen was allowed to attend, and a vote of the assembly was law. The assembly was chaired not by career politicians, but by ordinary citizens chosen at random for a term of one month. They were put up at state expense in the circular tholos, 
Next door was the council chamber, where 500 ordinary citizens met each day. It was their job to prepare the agenda for the assembly back on the hill of the Pnyx. If we were to follow Athens' example, we would have a different Prime Minister each month selected by lot, and we would all take our turn in Parliament. They didn't elect people to make decisions for them. They ruled and were ruled in turn. Was this section excavated? We have reason to believe that this is one of the law courts. Archaeologists have unearthed tangible proof of the Athenian pursuit of equality. They found an Athenian ballot box. When it was excavated, uh, little bronze discs like this, seven of them were found, and they carry an inscription on them, as you can see. They say, public ballot. And you as a juror in the law courts would be given two of these, one with a solid axle and one with a pierced axle. One disc represented a vote for guilty and the other for not guilty. You would hold them so people couldn't see which way you were voting, throw mm -hmm. one into the ballot box, and a verdict would be arrived at. Fantastic. A lot of thought has gone into this, hasn't no, it? No, they want to make sure that the jurors don't feel coerced in any way. Yeah, so, yeah. so plenty of checks and balances. It has to be a secret ballot. The <laughs> courts are tremendously important for the functioning of the democracy. Yeah. Mind you, I'm a woman, so I wouldn't have been allowed to vote. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so I'll do it now. To make sure that the juries were fairly chosen, brilliant technology was devised. This is called a clariterion, and it was a random selection machine. Now, how it works is that individual citizens would have their names inscribed onto metal tags that would then be inserted into each of these slots. Down the side here, there would have been a wooden chute, which, of course, hasn't survived over the millennia, and down the chute would be sent black and white marble balls. If your name lined up with either a black or a white marble ball, it meant that you were or you weren't going to be selected that day. And because this process happened every day that there was democratic business to be done, it was impossible to bribe jurors or to pull rank so that you were always chosen. It shows just how important equality and fair play was to the early democracy. In theory, you can be a magistrate that proposes a law, you can sit in the assembly and vote for the law, and then four months later, you could be sitting on the jury that's going to decide how it's to be interpreted or if it's even constitutional. You can hold any office in the state. A seismic shift had occurred. But in a world where rule by the many was confined to one city in a thousand, the survival of the infant democracy was in peril. Only 20 years after its foundation, a timely discovery would transform Athens' fortunes and turn it into the richest city in Greece. At the dawn of the 5th century BC, the ancient city of Athens sat perched on the edge of the civilized world. Democracy might not have survived, had it not been for a windfall that made Athens rich. At the bottom tip of the Athenian peninsula lies Laurium, the industrial heart of ancient Athens. Even today, the landscape is littered with the spoil of hundreds of abandoned mine shafts. Although off the tourist trail, Larium has an important story to tell, that the Athenian Golden Age was actually built on silver. People have been mining here since the early Bronze Age because the rock is so rich in mineral deposits. But then in 483 BC, the Athenians struck a giant seam of lead, carrying within it precious particles of silver. Overnight, democratic Athens was filthy rich. Recent excavations have uncovered a complete settlement of tiny houses and streets. The conditions here are pretty cramped. 
Actually, it's not that different from other towns and villages of the period. What makes this place different is that. This building has just been identified by some archaeologists as the remains of a watchtower. The living quarters surrounding the tower were not occupied by citizens, but by slaves. Seems the Athenians wanted to keep their slaves under 24-hour surveillance. And it's no surprise they were jumpy. We are talking massive numbers. As many as one in three of the people who lived in Athens were slaves. The Athenians could be such vigorous Democrats because they had someone else to do their dirty work for them. The Athenian citizens felt their freedom all the more keenly as the owners of people who had lost theirs. In ancient Greece, liberty has an inflection which it doesn't have in our society. Namely, there are an awful lot of unfree people, I mean slaves. Mm. And in fact, not far from where we're standing right now was one of the slave markets in the centre of Athens. We mustn't forget the dark underside of the democratic achievement. Most slaves began their lives as free men and women but were forced into a life of manual labor when they became prisoners of war. They were bought and sold, separated from their families, sterilized so as not to breed. It wasn't only slaves. In fact, nine-tenths of the population were barred from voting. There was an age restriction, and it wasn't enough to be born in Athens. Both your father and your mother had to be born there too. And of the remaining free Athenians, half, like me, were automatically disqualified. Women weren't just unequal, they were believed to be demonic, possessed by demones, spirits. They needed to be controlled, visibly restricted. In fact, the first hard evidence of the full face veil comes from Athens. Women were not meant to be seen. All the evidence of vase painting would suggests that the woman is veiled. Mm. She has her cloak draped over her head. Should we have a, have a go? Sue Blundell is researching the status of women in Athenian society. And just drape it over your arm like that. And then if you want to cover your face, you can go like that. Yes. Lovely. Well, look, I match. Sophocles said, silence is the greatest ornament of the woman. I feel yeah. nicely silent well, like that. I hate it, it makes me feel really claustrophobic. <laughs> The message that's being sent out is that a married woman is the possession of the man. Yes, he is the one person in her life for whom she will unveil herself, yes. It wasn't only Athens, almost every society till the 20th century has been fiercely patriarchal. But there was, in that searing mass of experimentation, the possibility that something different could have been done. Where do we hear about that? We hear about it as a joke. Aristophanes imagines what would happen if women took over. We hear about it as philosophical thought. So Plato imagines what happens if we got rid of the family and had women as well as men as guardians of his republic. But of course it didn't happen. Only the free men of Athens could belong to the democratic club, which met together on the Pnyx. At dawn, Athenian citizens would come here to sit around on the bare rock and debate in the assembly how it was that they should run their own lives. So we're going to do an experiment in Greek democracy. So who's for? The purpose of life for an ordinary human being, in essence, was a political life. And who's against? It's absolutely unparalleled in world history. So the motion's carried. And every Moens Hansen is a world authority on Athenian democracy and how it worked in practice. This is where the people meet to pass their laws, to pass their decrees, to elect their prime minister, and they all do it by show of hands. That's the voice of the people. The Athenians believed the name Pnyx was derived from the adjective pugnas, which means crowded or densely packed. The Pnyx covers 2,400 square meters, 
a person takes up 0.4 square meters if he sits down. Thus, it could accommodate 6,000 citizens. Important legislation needed to be endorsed by a vote of 6,000. And that's exactly the number of people Mearns has worked out that fits onto the crowded Pnix. But it's impossible to count 6,000 hands. Mearns went to the cantons of Switzerland, where they guesstimate the vote. First, I took photos, and then I blew up my photos. And with a pencil, I dotted each hand, so I could check that this was a fair method of deciding a majority in a large assembly. You think that is their way of doing it? Yes, it is. Aristotle shows that they did the same in Athens. Just think of the hubbub of the assembly. 6,000 men here together. Shoemakers sitting next to nobles and all debating issues which directly affected their lives. Heralds kept order and there was a police force of slaves nearby if things got out of hand. But we're told that if the crowd really disliked one man's argument, they would shout him down until the roar reached to the skies. So seriously did Athenians take being a player in democracy that they called people who didn't participate idiotes, which gives us our word, idiot. Athenians actually had a word for politicians, and it was orator. People who were specially practiced and skilled in addressing large crowds. So you can get one orator to stand up against another, and in that way the people can choose it's very important that you always have more than one voice. This young woman is called Patho, persuasion. The Athenians worshipped her as a goddess. They bestowed great honours on her in the hope that she, in return, would give them the gift of a fine speaking voice, sweet words, and a fifth century talent for spin. In 483 BC, the Citizen Assembly had a weighty decision to make. What to do with the flood of silver pouring in from the mines? Now, there's nothing like a discussion of how to spend a fortune to get the creative juices flowing. And one day, in 483 BC, a man called Themistocles stood up with a brave and far-sighted plan. Themistocles wasn't from one of the old aristocratic families. He was someone who'd benefited directly from the new opportunities of democracy. He was hungry, and he had the verve and focus of a man freshly empowered. Themistocles' vision was that Athens should command the seas. Persian power was a threat to Athens' existence. Themistocles was well aware that they'd already invaded Greek lands. To everyone's surprise, the Athenians defeated a massive army at Marathon. Although the Persians retreated, Themistocles knew that it was only a matter of time before Persia's King Xerxes returned to settle old scores. He was intent, this time, Athens would take her enemies on at sea. Athenians needed a brand new fleet of warships, not a tax break, he argued in the assembly. It's a tribute to Themistocles' powers of persuasion and to the acumen of the assembly that they approved his strategy. Over the next three years, the Athenians would build themselves a fleet of over 200 triremes. This was a fundamental shift in the way the Athenians made war. Triremes would be the new weapon of democracy. The word trireme means three oars. Rowers were arranged in three banks, one above the other. It's faster, it's more deadly than any warship that had been used before. 
This is the technology that the Athenians have to master in order to defeat the largest navy in the world, the Persian Navy. Triremes offered the perfect balance of speed and weight. They're highly maneuverable with twin rudders. Athens was already a democracy. It's no accident they mastered this form of warfare. The Greeks associated the word techne, our technology, with the triremes. And that is the great Athenian strength, playing to technology, playing to innovation. There would have been about 170 oarsmen on a boat like this. Most of them would have been packed down here. You can just imagine what the atmosphere would have been like. Very cramped, very sweaty. And then as you rowed, your face smacks up into the back of the man in front of you. But the situation here forced a feeling of community. And because these things were the engines of the fleet, you knew that your muscle counted. The trireme is so perfect, it's hard to think of a better symbol of Athens and its democracy. The development of the fleet has remarkable political consequences, and I think the Athenians knew it. We know that upper-class upper Athenians were hostile to developing the fleet, and it's perhaps because they saw what was coming. Once you had a fleet, Athenian power would rest on the shoulders of the poorest people in society. The military power of Athens depended on the fleet, and so the political power followed it uh, inevitably, and Athens became more of a real democracy. In the east, Xerxes' preparations for conquest gathered pace. He mustered a colossal army from across his empire. Rational debate wasn't enough to decide the Athenian strategy. They needed assurance from higher powers. A hundred miles northwest of Athens in Delphi lies the sacred oracle of Apollo. In Apollo's temple, questions were put to the priestess and her enigmatic replies were then translated by priests. The Athenians came to ask advice. Their question, with what strategy could they best defeat the invading Persians, the mightiest army in the known world? The answer came back. Zeus grants to thrice-born Athena a wooden wall. In this, and only this, shall she be secure. The meaning of the wooden walls was debated on the Pnyx. Some argued it meant the protective palisades on the Acropolis. If the Athenians took refuge there, they'd be safe. Themistocles was in no doubt. The wooden walls meant the navy. In a vote, the Athenians agreed with their admiral. Man, woman and child evacuated their city for the nearby island of Salamis. They waited for the battle to begin. In September 480, the Persian army entered Athens, hungry for revenge. Xerxes found the whole territory deserted. The Persians razed the Acropolis to the ground, stole its treasures and torched whatever was left. These deformed statues, blistered and buckled, provide vivid evidence of the terrible fires that raged on the Acropolis. All the Athenians could do was watch as their city burned. They waited with their Greek allies on the nearby island of Salamis. The key was to get the Persians to fight where the Athenians wanted a battle. The only way to do that was to trick them. Themistocles sent a message to the Persians saying his men were deserting. Were the Persians to enter the Straits by dawn, they could capture his fleet without a fight. He was gambling the Persians would believe him and row straight into a trap. <laughs> 
At dawn on the 25th of September, the Persian ships filed into the narrow waters. The modern Greek Navy has a base at Salamis. Captain Cosmas Christidis studied the battle while training to be an officer. Welcome on board. Thank Captain. you. He's used his intimate knowledge of the straits to bring new evidence to the textbook history. Here, you can see now, there is where the battle took place. Yeah. On the right side, there were the Greeks. On the left side, the Persian. The Greeks were outnumbered two to one. But the straits were so narrow, only half the Persian fleet could enter. Themistocles had lured the Persians into his trap. The Strait of Salamis, which is around uh, 300 yards, mm -hmm. the Persian fleet cannot be deployed. That's very clever, isn't it? Because you've got such a narrow area. So, as you said, yeah. you're, you're limiting the number of Persian boats that can come in. That's correct. Themistocles also knew that the morning currents and crosswinds would disorientate the Persian fleet. The wind turned them like this. So he wants to ram the side of the boats. And he succeeded. The tactics of a battle were to ram the enemy and then to quickly back off before the enemy could do damage to you. The Athenians face the best part of the Persian fleet. And they defeat them. The remaining Persian ships turn to flee. So what results is just an enormous and remarkably bloody traffic jam. It's a massacre. The blood in the water, men being speared like tuna fish. And it goes on all day. Xerxes watched as the Persian fleet was steadily annihilated. This victory would underpin Athenian democracy. One factor which made the democratic experiment the way it was, was the Persian Wars. Just having a bunch of people coming in, taking over Athens, smashing your statues up on the Acropolis there. You start thinking, hey, why did we win? What makes us different from them? And so if there wasn't a notion of um, the power of the people as against dictatorship and tyranny before the Persian invasion, there was after. All over the city, public monuments were set up eulogizing the victory. The message was clear. Western democracy could and should triumph over Eastern tyranny. The schism between East and West had been set in stone. Salamis is just a key event in Western history. All the things we associate with the golden age of 5th century Greece, the democracy, the art, the literature, the history, the philosophical debates about empire and power above all, that wouldn't have happened without Salamis. Having triumphed decisively over tyranny, democratic Athens set its sights on building an empire. They understood that once the Persians pulled out of the Aegean, that the Aegean would be a power vacuum, and that if the Greeks didn't move in, the Persians would come back. The Athenians simply couldn't allow that to happen. The Greek states that ringed the coast of the Aegean formed a grand confederacy with Athens for protection against the Persians. Historians call it the Delian League, after the small island where the Allies had their headquarters. Delos was a sacred place, the legendary birthplace of Apollo and Artemis. I think the Greeks got it right when they thought the gods of wind, sea and sky roamed round here. It was very astute to base the League here. This was a neutral island. And also primevally sacred, a fog of mystery and superstition surrounded the place. This is not somewhere that you'd have tampered with. To begin with, the League was a huge success. 
As time went on, it became more and more clear that Athens, with its vast navy, was the obvious leader of the League. Many of the smaller states found it impossible to man a fleet all year round. So it suited both sides for Athens to provide protection and take money from the Allies for the service. To celebrate the foundation of the League, this temple to Apollo was built, and in it, a massive treasury where all the League's cash could be stored. But then, just 20 years later, the League stops building work, which is very odd, because this is the time when the Greek world is at its most prosperous. And then you realise there's something else going on here. Building had stopped on Delos because the treasury of the League had been moved from its neutral territory to Athens itself. Allies who attempted to leave the coalition soon found themselves forced back in by the Athenians. What had once been a mutual defence pact was now looking very much like an empire. But what was behind Athens' new thirst for imperial power? Democratic imperialism may be down to something as basic as the need for grain. Grain is the oil of the ancient world. Whoever controls its supply can keep a stranglehold on power. Barley or wheat was the staple food of Greece. When it ran short, the people starved. Huge swathes of the landscape around Athens are rocky and infertile. This area is now built up with housing, but these spy photos taken by the RAF during the Second World War show terraces where the ancient Athenians desperately tried to squeeze maximum food out of the soil. Fifth century Athens might have been riding on the crest of a wave, but it still needed to feed itself. Proof that Athens was desperate for grain was found in the most unlikely of places. When they were examining the ancient drainage system in the Agora, they found a stone recording payments to Athens. This is an inscription relating to tax, and it tells us that Athens asked Athenians abroad to pay their tax, not in silver, but in ton siton. Grain. Now, new evidence about how the grain supply motivated the drive for empire has come from Oxford historian Alfonso Moreno. This was much more fertile ground than Athens. He found a whole range of Athenian forts on lush, fertile Euboea. Athens had conquered Euboea, reducing its population to serfdom. It was very unfortunate to live on flat, fertile land. You do yes. attract gannets. Yes, especially unfortunate if you happen to live right across a, a very small stream of water from the Athenians. Following rare maps and surveys, Alfonso discovered a network of unexcavated forts, proving successive generations of Athenians spent huge resources on conquering and defending yet more of Euboea. They went so far as to evacuate the entire population of this part of the island, and they moved it out forcibly. How many people are we talking about? It's a good guess that it's probably 50,000 people, and in their place are put one or two thousand Athenians. It makes you wonder whether people realize that uh, democracy isn't necessarily a virtuous thing. This stone stele represents the monumental might of the Athenian Empire. You can see that all over the stone surface there are closely carved inscriptions listing the places that owed tribute money to Athens, from Palestine to the Black Sea. It's an incomplete jigsaw puzzle now, but it represents a continuous flood of money pouring into the Athenian coffers up on the Acropolis. The domination of Euboea and the aggressive imperial project was the policy of Athens' most powerful aristocrat, Heracles. He was the darling of the people. Thucydides wrote of him that during his leadership, Athens was in name a democracy, but in fact under the rule of one man. Heracles was following on a long tradition of competition to deliver to the people of Athens ever larger prizes. And Euboea was just the 
the largest, the latest example of that. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? The aristocrats standing on bits of coastline like this, looking out across the sea and wondering where it is that they can lay their hands on next. You know, I think that's more or less precisely what they did. This was a kind of competition. It was, in many ways, the transferal of the archaic ideal that you see in the Olympic Games to a political arena. And democracy was the ultimate way of playing a competitive game with other members of the elite. And the people derived great riches from the invasions, the feats of the aristocratic prowess of their leaders. First they had silver mines, and now they had an empire. Democratic Athenians had more money than they could spend. Pericles used the surplus in a brash new way to create for the people a symbol of their own imperial glory. In 447 BC, work began on the defining symbol of ancient Greece, the Parthenon. In 447 BC, the modest temple of Athena that had lain in ruins since the Persian invasion was rebuilt on an epic scale. It was the favorite undertaking of Pericles, the Parthenon. For 15 years, citizens, slaves and foreigners labored side by side to construct one of the most celebrated buildings in history. But the million tourists who visit each year find a site covered in scaffolding and cranes. The restoration is giving new insight into the original construction. Do you know how many would have been working on here when it was first built? Yes, I believe that it was about 200 people for the action of the Parthenon. 200? Yes. And from sunrise working to sunset. Sun yeah. Eating in the building. We found that between the members, we found bones from chicken and cells. Seashells? So, yes, yes, seashells. Fantastic. They are sitting over there <laughs> looking at the view. Fantastic and eating <laughs> upstairs. That's brilliant. So having kind of shellfish picnic while they build the Parthenon. The Parthenon was adorned with reliefs, including those supreme aristocrats, the Athenian cavalry. It was the biggest temple in Greece. Every powerful city or state wants to express his strength. I think this is an appearance of that. Yeah, a monument to power. Yes. Well, the Parthenon is always called a temple. What people forget is it was primarily a bank. It was a place in which we put money, treasures, and it wasn't used for any religious ritual that we know. Not only does it put its money and treasures there, but it was built out of money from the empire. So far from being a symbol of a pure white Hellenism, it's a symbol of how Athens asserted power over a lot of rather smaller states and used it to glorify itself. But Pericles' beloved project was stirring up trouble. Factions in the city were enraged that the Democrats could steal from the defense fund to provide sops for the people. They brought their complaint to Pericles in the assembly. The allies must be outraged, they cried. They must consider this an act of barefaced tyranny when they see that with their own contributions, extorted from them by force for the war against the Persians, we are gilding and beautifying our city, dressing her up like a common whore. Pericles' response was as much a defense of empire as it was of its most potent symbol. The Allies do not give us a single horse, nor a soldier, nor a ship. All they supply is money, he told the Athenians. It is no more than fair that after Athens has been equipped with all she needs to carry on the war to protect the Allies, she should apply the surplus to public works, which, once completed, will bring her glory for all time. It's a politician very cleverly spinning the situation and writing his legacy into the history books. Athens drove her imperial project ever further. Those that resisted were punished, men, women and children massacred. It is the nature of man, Athenians said, to take power wherever he can. The strong do what they like, 
and the weak accept what they have to accept. In the name of democracy, they pursued an aggressive foreign policy which set them on a collision course with their rival city-states. In 432 BC, the Athenians found themselves confronted with an enemy they could not overpower. The ancient world's most formidable military force, Sparta. It was an irony worthy of Greek tragedy that Sparta, virtually a totalitarian state, now claimed to be the liberator of Greece from the tyranny of Athens, the world's first democracy. Pericles had taken Athens into a disastrous war, yet he appears to have been brilliant at persuading his citizens that they were dying for a higher cause. At the annual burial ceremony of the city's war dead, he gave a last impassioned speech in defense of democracy and Athens. I could tell you a long story about what is to be gained by beating the enemy back. What I would prefer is that you should fix your eyes every day on the greatness of Athens. Our constitution is called a democracy because power is in the hands of the whole people. Everyone is equal before the law. What counts is not membership of a particular class, but the ability which a man possesses. They are fine and persuasive words. And for centuries, we've chosen to take these as representative of the true spirit of fifth century Greece. But there are many who wouldn't have bought into Pericles' vision of a free and tolerant society. This was a time when unorthodox views were circulating throughout the city and they were viewed as very dangerous. Democratic Athens was beginning to fracture. The evidence for how the breakup occurred is only now emerging. Words really were the lifeblood of the Athenian democracy. Here, there are many millions of words that were written in the 5th century BC, which haven't even been translated yet. An unofficial history of the city is starting to emerge. In the next programme, I'm going to see how bitter rivalries, both in and outside Athens, created havoc for the democracy, and how newly discovered documents are changing our ideas of the Golden Age. In the year 399 BC, a Greek court tried the philosopher Socrates for crimes against the state. The 70-year-old was found guilty of introducing new gods and corrupting the young. He was forced to drink poison. The city which sentenced him to death wasn't a tyranny or a totalitarian regime. It was a democracy one of the first democracies and certainly the most vigorous of all time. So how can it be that Athens, the city which created the concept of freedom of speech, should vote to kill one of its wisest citizens simply for speaking his mind freely? In the second part of this series, we'll see how Socrates pushed democratic liberty to its limits and was destroyed. I'll explore Athens in its golden age. Home to great artists, philosophers and scientists, but also tearing itself apart from within. Could it be the very things that made democratic Athens great also held the seeds of its destruction? <laughs>
At the end of the 6th century BC, the Greek city of Athens took a dramatic step in the history of mankind. The aristocracy handed over power to the people. They said, why don't we try something extraordinary? We can rule ourselves. This grand experiment in popular rule lasted for just over a century. This we take to be a ballot box. The ordinary men of the city got to make every political decision themselves. Sephos Demosia, which means public vote. It's absolutely unparalleled in world history. Fifth century Athens is the place where most of our central ideas are put in place. Our ideas of Western culture, words like democracy, like theatre, and the whole principles of the legal system. These are an inheritance from Greece. If we want to understand where ideas have come from, we have to go back there. But the Athenian experiment was hardly a utopia, some kind of progressive wonderland. While men were newly empowered, slaves and women remained oppressed. All the evidence of vase paintings suggests that the woman is veiled in that she has her cloak draped over her head. The Athenian Democrats repeatedly voted to go to war. They amassed a vast empire, forcing whole populations to become refugees. The Athenians take overseas territories, dividing them democratically among themselves. And that it was essentially what exporting democracy meant. So is our image of Athens, benign, high-minded, a solid bedrock for Western civilization, is all this just a bit rose-tinted? In 438 BC, the Parthenon was finally completed and Athens was flying high. The Athenian democracy had amassed the largest empire Greece had ever seen. Over 150 states from North Africa to the Crimea handed over vast sums to the Athenian treasury, which paid for a navy which roamed the seas unopposed. These ships were not for show. In its golden age, there were no two years when Athenian citizens did not vote to go to war. Its ruinous conflict with the Spartans, the Peloponnesian War, was to be the backdrop for all its high achievement. This war is such an abysmal milestone in the history of civilization. Massacres, killing all the males, enslaving the women and children. This becomes standard practice in the Peloponnesian War. This is a new and terrible mode of warfare for the Greeks. But amongst all this conflict, from every corner of the empire, a stream of artists, architects and philosophers flooded into the city, bringing with them new experiences, new ideas. There's a real sea change in how people thought about what they were doing. Instead of just doing what we were doing before, we could now think about it. And that led to experimentation. And that idea that you could experiment is what makes democracy and the Enlightenment go together. That sense of ceaseless experimentation and thought. This bronze of a Greek god is one of the most celebrated artefacts of the ancient world. And I think one of the reasons is because despite his antiquity, he looks like us. The stiff and formal figures that the Greeks had learnt from the artists of Egypt began to disappear as a more realistic style emerged. It's been called the Greek miracle, but there's new evidence to suggest that the change in style was accompanied by an innovative technique, casting from life. Nobody has ever got it to look quite so lifelike. I think if you then put some clay just around... There, Sculptor Nigel Constam believes they used live models. So you think that in the workshops of the famous sculptors of the day, they had models and they, they covered them in plaster in order to get a cast from life, is that right? That's right. In high classical times, uh, they were using life cast. There's no other explanation. Why do you think it is that the experts don't want to believe your theory? 
Well, I think nearly everyone regards him as the greatest sculptors ever. And to show that it was arrived at by this rather simple method, it's, it's painful. Nigel's been sculpting for 40 years, and when he studied the soles of the feet of the 5th century bronzes, he recognised the telltale signs of a sculptor's trick, something many art historians had missed. In all the Greek bronzes that have survived, you get the sole of the foot distorted by pressure of the body on the foot. They're very naturalistic, not at all the way somebody would carve. There's only one way you can get that, and that is casting. Live human models were copied in plaster. We will take this mould off, assemble that, and we pour wax in it. The important thing is this bit here. The shapes of the toes show weight upon it. Do you think that why they're doing it is because they are trying to achieve absolute human perfection? Yes, I think so. Although it looks a bit disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> In Athens, experimentation wasn't only limited to the arts. This is the place where some of our most fundamental scientific theories were debated and honed. Natural philosophers wanted to explore the basic matter of the universe. The invention of the optical microscope was over 2,000 years away. And yet without the microscope, the Greeks came up with the idea of an irreducibly small particle and they gave it a name meaning indivisible, atomas, atom. It's just astonishing to me that they were able to think in that really abstract way. Things like what is matter made of and the idea of atoms. Uh, of course, it's taken us uh, until the last decade or so until we could actually isolate and visualize individual atoms as we can here. Scientifically, that's difficult to do. It's completely cutting edge. It's right at the limit of what we can technologically do today. At last, atoms can be seen in the light of a laser, in a vacuum. The Greeks couldn't see atoms, but they could imagine them. To come up with the ideas in the first place, that's the power of Greek thought, to have the ideas that there are out there laws of nature that we could perhaps discover by doing experiments and thinking about them rather than just saying, well, this happens, this apple falls to the ground when I drop it because God says so, or there's some God which is putting the stars in the sky. They made a pretty good estimate of the distance of the moon, but they even were thinking about how far away the stars must be. While art and science pushed ahead, the most radical advances were being made in pure thought. No one personifies the breakthrough in ideas more than Socrates the most influential philosopher in the Western world. Born the son of a midwife and a stonemason, Socrates was in most respects a completely ordinary Athenian citizen. He served in the infantry, took his turn as a city official. He didn't write great works or open a philosophical school. But he did gain influence with aristocrats, whose sons competed for entry to his circle. Socrates was a fantastically original thinker. Central to his view of the world was the idea that each man should pursue his individual path to truth and to the good life. In fact, a lot of Socrates' ideas struck right at the heart of confident, ballsy, democratic Athens. He kept on asking these really irritating questions like, does wealth really make you happy? in an open society. Why do we keep on needing to build city walls? Much of what Socrates had to say was simply not what the bulk of Athenians wanted to hear. He must have cut a strange figure in a city that made a cult of the beautiful, famously ugly. He rarely washed or wore shoes. It had been a familiar sight striding along in his threadbare cloak, surrounded by bright young men eager to hear his novel ideas. When he met anyone who was renowned as an expert, he set about asking them questions, and in the process, invented an entirely new method of rational inquiry. <laughs> 
Do you know what the difference is between good and evil? Yes, goodness is what the gods love and evil is what they hate. But there are different gods. They don't always agree. That's true. So they love and hate different things. Yes. That would mean that some things were both loved and hated by the gods. So some things are both good and evil. I suppose it would. Well then, it looks like you haven't really answered my questions, have you? No. For most of the people he went up to, he asked questions that made them feel humiliated, ignorant and, and uncomfortable. He famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates' method of philosophy may seem familiar to us, but at the time it was breathtakingly new. It laid the foundation of our belief that all things can be questioned. But it would earn him as many enemies as friends. Socrates' unsettling questions were to trouble not merely its citizens, but Athenian democracy itself. The 5th century BC saw an explosion in new scientific ideas all around Greece. Philosophers started to develop theories of how the world was made up of atoms and elements, how diseases could be cured, how societies ordered. A new breed, historians, sought to document, not decorate, events. They called it rational inquiry. But rationalism competed with an older worldview, one dominated by the gods which Athenians learnt as children from epic poems and myths. The Greeks all knew the stories. They knew that the gods and goddesses lived on Mount Olympus, where they squabbled and drank and had affairs with each other. But they also knew that they physically inhabited sacred patches of earth. And so they started to build for them monumental stone temples, earthly palaces for the god tribe. At the time, even wealthy men lived in mud brick structures. The spirit world was honored with opulence, for religion was supreme. These gorgeous, gigantic structures have come to resemble the essence of Greek culture. They seem solid, confident, robust. But just because the temples have lasted, we shouldn't be fooled into thinking that Greek religious life was all about grand gestures in monumental stone. In one way, you get a better sense of the real ritual experience of the Athenians if you come down here late at night. This whole side of the rock was dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, and men and women would continually come here to leave offerings in specially carved niches. During one festival, young virgins would clamber down. This staircase was carved back in the Bronze Age. They carried what we were told were baskets of unspeakable offerings and they would stay here all night to worship the goddess. Encouraging women to worship Aphrodite had an interesting political use. Aphrodite is the goddess of sexual love, but she's also the goddess of persuasion and harmony. In a political system where there were so many players, each with vested interests, harmony was vital. And by worshipping Aphrodite, it was thought that women could entice this cosmic glue out of the goddess. In ancient Greek, there is no separate word for religion. Ritual was just part and parcel of everyday life and the political process. Gods and demigods were thought to walk the streets and be around every corner. But unfortunately, these were often malevolent spirits who demanded appeasement. 
Recent excavations show that black magic too was at the heart of the Greeks' famously just and rational judicial system. In the main cemetery of Athens, the Keramikos, underground wells and cisterns have yielded hundreds of cursed tablets. This poor chap's had his hands tied behind his back and he's been sealed in a lead coffin. And we know his name because on the lid of the coffin there's a very crude inscription that reads Mnei Simakos and all his cronies in the legal case. So whoever commissioned this was prosecuting Mnei Simakos and hoped that by creating this thing he could appropriate some kind of supernatural power so that the outcome of the law case was favourable to him. There are many of these things. So clearly this kind of magic was an unofficial but an integral part of the Athenian judicial system. Scholars have often struggled with Greek religion. It doesn't square easily with the Athens they wanted to see, that was sophisticated and rational. Athens might have been a democracy, but it had emerged from an archaic world of multiple gods and primordial rituals. For the Athenians, there was one particular festival they cherished, which fostered a sense of togetherness. It was known as the Mysteries. The ritual started with a procession from the Keramikos Cemetery, all along the Sacred Way. For years, it's been virtually impossible to work out what went on, because this was a mystery religion, and initiates to the cult were bound by an oath of silence. The secret rituals promised hope of a happy afterlife. The men and women arrived at Eleusis in time for the nocturnal celebrations. You have to try to imagine what it must have been like for them to be here. Approaching the sanctuary, they passed a cave, which was thought to be the entrance to the underworld itself. Hades, the god of the underworld, had raped and abducted the goddess Demeter's daughter, Persephone. The ritual torch procession was to console the goddess for the loss of her child. Demeter could have her daughter back, but only for eight months of the year. The myth was an allegory for the cycle of nature, the death of crops in the autumn and their magical rebirth in the spring. To the initiates, it must also have meant a promise of their own rebirth after death. There'd have been the smell of smoke from thousands of pine torches. Then you arrived here at the gates to the sanctuary. In fact, you can see how heavy they were from these ruts where the doors were dragged open so that the thousands of cult followers could make their way into the sacred space. Athens jealously guarded admission to the mysteries. Those who revealed the secret rites risked the death penalty. Any attempt to divulge the secrets of the cult was considered an attack on democracy itself. Michael Cosmopolis has been the chief archaeologist here at Eleusis and has studied Greek ideas of the afterlife. This fear of death progressively it gets more and more intense. The reasons for this have to do probably with the emergence of the individual as a separate unit within democratic city-states, mm -hmm. especially Athens. What you're saying is that as you get more of a sense of yourself in the democratic system, that's when you can really start to address what happens to you after you die. Yes, you start wondering about the big issues of life and death. And it is here at Eleusis that people try to find some answers for the first time. There is no heaven or hell. The world of the dead is this place without hope, without joy. Mystery cults has offered the hope at getting a better afterlife. And perhaps even finding your way to the Elysian fields, the closest that Greek religion comes to a notion of paradise. So what would have happened to the initiates once they arrived here? Well, they would line up right there at the end of the sacred way. Each person would come into the temple. And as you can see, this whole building is basically a huge theater. Yeah. The doors would lock, and that was the beginning of the ritual. 
most scholars agree was a reenactment of the actual myth of the abduction of Persephone by Hades and her final reunion with her mother Demeter. When we watch a play or a movie, we, we identify with the personalities. Persephone has gone to the underworld and she has returned. It's like your best friend has defeated death. Therefore, you draw strength and courage from that victory so you don't fear death. This was as close as the Greeks would come to virtual reality mm. in the sense that they would simulate death in ritual. Like us, the Athenians struggled with insoluble moral debates and they chose to play these out in public and invented a new art form in order to do so. Drama gives us an insight into what the Greeks thought about life overall, because they lived their lives in a very strict, logical, well-structured society. And when you live in a, that kind of society, some of your passions and feelings are suppressed. So by celebrating, they were allowed to have an outlet for mm -hmm. these passions and uh, feelings that they suppressed for the rest of the year. The dramas dealt with horrific extremes of behavior, sons raping mothers, brothers and sisters making love, mothers eating their children. All the dreadful potential of man was laid bare here. And a constant theme was the pursuit of power. Playwrights made it quite clear that even a democracy couldn't quench the ambitions of ruthless individuals. At almost exactly the same moment as the creation of democracy, something radical happened. One man stepped out of the chorus to take centre stage. One actor became two, two became three. Drama was born. I think it's better than religion. I think tragedy is one of the great inventions of all time. At Delphi, the poet Tony Harrison explains his take on Greek tragedy. Just as some people need religion to answer the questions of what we suffer from, it was an important part of their politics, their culture, their debate. Certainly, they don't separate art and culture in the way that we do, for something to do in the evening. The theatrical performances were during the day, weren't they? Very important to remember that they were done in the full light of day. They brought these things to the light of day, Istophos, to the light. If you're in the darkness, how could you bear such dark subject matter? The tragedies, most of them are written at the time of the Peloponnesian War. Are we seeing any of that terrible, real historical time re reflected back, back into the drama? Well, we do get terrible stories of war in, for example, Euripides' Hecuba. In the play, the Greeks are debating whether to sacrifice a young girl to glorify the dead warrior Achilles. The people were most eloquent in debating uh, for sacrificing her are Athenians. So undermining their own democracy by having a democratic act to kill an innocent. Yeah, and it can be a true horror of democracy that, that the mass of people mm. can vote for something which is appalling. What followed after was will clash and conflict, welling and surging through the whole summoned army, some for the sacrifice and others against. The sons of Theseus, both bred in Athens, made separate speeches, but were of the same mind that the grave man of Achilles be given its crown of glory, a fresh gore garland from a green girl. It's all the language of democratic voting used to sacrifice an innocent girl. The same language you needed for the persuasion in the law courts and, and the assembly. Uh, at the end of the war, I think when I was eight, I saw in a terrible film of bulldozing bodies in Belson, and it it really went into my soul, and I thought, well, how can you find ways to express the terrors of our own time? And then I discovered this great theatre of light and this style to 
express uh, darkness. Uh, and I always think, of, when I'm here in Delphi, I always go and touch these stones down here on the polygonal wall, because that, for me, is a metaphor for tragedy. It was built with all these strange shapes that when the earthquake came, they would lock. They wouldn't fall down like regular bricks. They would lock together more, more tightly. And, and this, for me, is like the, the verse of, of tragedy containing and surviving the earthquake of dark uh, emotion. Because mm, those blocks have all got... They're inscribed, and they? And, and they're inscribed. Yes. The wonderful thing is that you can see letters joining them together. And I always think it's really the words that hold everything up. When you hear the words of Greek tragedy, you don't get the impression of a culture that is calm and robust. This feels like a society in turmoil, somewhere that is at once immensely confident and immensely insecure. That tension runs all the way through Athenian society. So in some ways we have this great intellectual explosion of we are now scientists, we can now progress. And all the time, Greek tragedy, a new genre, new trendy literature, is reminding us, no, you can't. Like Oedipus, you're going to find out that actually, when you thought you were in control, you've been sleeping with your mother, you killed your father, your life has been one big sham. The person who thinks he has the answer is the person who's leading himself into tragedy. And now Athens, too, was courting tragedy, spawned by the tension of new ideas and old beliefs. Fifth century Athens was transforming herself. But new ideas were setting her on a collision course with tradition. While builders were widening this road, they came across something they were not expecting to find. Three aristocratic graves in pristine condition. When archaeologists came here the next day to investigate, they were astounded. They described this tomb as being suffocatingly full of artefacts. There was gold and bronze and alabaster perfume jars. But in fact, it was up here on the top of the tomb in the charred remains of the funeral pyre that the greatest treasure would appear. The tomb was clearly of a wealthy aristocrat, someone who could afford such elaborately decorated artifacts. Amongst the riches of the tombs, the fragments of burnt papyrus turned out to be the oldest surviving book in Europe. These words have been burnt, scattered on top of a tomb and buried in the earth for 2,400 years. So it is close to miraculous that they've survived at all. In this little fragment here, we learn that Zeus has raped his mother, who then goes on to give birth to Aphrodite. So you can just see Aphrodite. The scrolls took years to decipher. But ideas contained in the writing presented a remarkable puzzle. Dirk Obink was the first scholar outside Greece to see the scrolls. At the Oxford Papyrology Institute, he uses spectral scanning to decipher the text using different wavelengths of light. When we took it down deep in the infrared spectrum, most of the colour disappears, but you get great contrast between the dark background and only slightly darker ink. An entire line of writing was produced. That section was so dark that, it, to the naked eye, it wasn't even read. It shows what multispectral imaging is able to do with a difficult-to-read text. The Devaney papyrus presented special problems because it had been rolled up in a scroll. But as with the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's taken a long time just to figure out what author was talking about. The author is commenting on a religious text. He tells us we shouldn't understand the myths literally, but interpret them scientifically. The author gives an analysis of a piece of religious poetry, but he thinks it mustn't be taken literally, it has to be taken allegorically, and when he analyzes it, he's presenting the view that it's actually an account of the creation of the world 
in terms of um, the current theory of molecular science, which is a truly extraordinary mode of interpretation. And the kind of thing you might find in the 18th century when Newton was reinterpreting the Bible as showing the latest physics. This scientist thinks that the universe always existed, has no beginning or end. That's why it's so exciting though, isn't it? Because this is the touch paper at the moment that it's being lit. This is um, the origins of modern science. It gives us an insight into a period when the Greeks were speculating about the origins of the universe. These theories are incredibly dangerous. In 414, the author of Diagoras of Milos, a friend of Socrates, was charged with impiety. The democracy put a price on his head and demanded that he be assassinated without trial, almost certainly because he dared to write this. Diagoras fled the city. Thinkers like Diagoras were becoming the target of suspicion and persecution because of their ability to mislead the people. Intellectuals and aristocrats would meet behind closed doors and discuss unorthodox ideas at the infamous symposium. That's one of the very peculiar things about the Athenian democracy. It's suspicion of any groups of people getting together. It's hatred of cliques because they could all be against the democracy. James Davidson has studied the symposium and the various power groups within Athenian society. Um, the Greek symposium is really a group of men who are all drinking together in a very small room. So it's a very intimate kind of environment. The symposium is supposed to be off duty. They're in a relaxed situation. Um, and you're not supposed to be talking about politics either. This is not a debating chamber. But underneath all of that, this is a way for people to establish links so politics keeps on creeping in through the back door. The symposium was rich with homosexual overtones, but the erotic dalliances were often a cover for secret networking. Is the homosexual relationship to do with power and status as well as sex? Um, I think it's more to do with male bonding. I know that sounds fairly obvious, but we very often find that um, there's a great anxiety about how the beloved is really in it for a political position and the Admara is really in it to have a little client or a little agent who will help him. It was at the symposium that Socrates drank with and inspired the most powerful of the aristocrats. He was the dazzling young general Alcibiades. The fame of an Olympic victory had propelled him into the limelight. Overnight, he'd become Athens' most charismatic and influential politician. At exactly this time, Plato tells us, Socrates and Alcibiades were to be found together at a famous symposium. Socrates reveals to Alcibiades and the other guests the mysteries of love. It's a clever adaptation of the mysteries of Eleusis. Its language, which mixes religion and science, is reminiscent of the Devaney papyrus. The ideas appeared radical. Alcibiades and others were engaged in uh, private celebrations that seemed to some people to be actually mocking the Eleusinian mysteries. And the Devaney papyrus could also well have been seen in some circles to have been mocking or trying to displace the traditional mysteries. But what had remained in private was about to erupt in public and shatter the career of Alcibiades and the fortunes of Athens. In 415, Alcibiades was riding a wave of public popularity. He persuaded the Athenians to enlarge the empire and conquer Sicily. But even before the expedition set off, something shocking happened. A religious scandal. Across Athens, at every street corner, were statues, representations of Hermes, the messenger god. The morning after they decided to sail for Sicily, the Athenians woke up to find hundreds of these statues mutilated, with their noses and erect phalluses cut off. An investigation was launched 
And witnesses started to come forward with information about the nocturnal antics of groups of aristocratic young men, debauched dinner parties in which the gods were mocked, and all whispered that Alcibiades was the ringleader. Once the fleet had arrived at Sicily, a boat was sent from Athens to bring Alcibiades back for trial. But Alcibiades escaped. He was now in Sparta, advising the enemy on how to defeat Athens. Now, that really was a bad omen. When it came to assaults on their religion, the Athenians were in a very ugly mood. They started a witch hunt. Of course, first, for the people who had smashed the statues, but secondly, for people who had been alleged to parody the Eleusinian mysteries. And the Athenians revoked the prohibition on citizens being tortured. And a lot of people were tortured and executed. It was a truly terrible time in the city. Things were looking very bad for Socrates. His most famous protege had become a national pariah. And all around him, his fellow intellectuals were being brought to trial. The scene was set for Socrates' own tragic drama. The last decades of the 5th century BC saw the end of the Golden Age of Athens, as her internal divisions were punished on a massive scale by the might of her foreign enemies. In just 15 years, the democracy itself would crumble and the man who'd come to define the first enlightened age would be put to death. In the year 413 BC, Athens had been at war for almost 20 years with Sparta. Athens' great hope of ending the war had been the brilliant young general Alcibiades, now in disgrace. Two years after the voyage to Sicily, the Athenian force, shorn of its greatest general, found itself trapped in the harbor at Syracuse. Her enemies closed in. The Athenians were annihilated. The few survivors started to limp back to the city. The stories they brought with them were so horrific that at first the Athenians refused to believe them. And then when they realized that these things were true, panic swept through the city. After Sicily, things went from bad to worse for Athens. Inside the city, there was political turmoil. The citizens looked for people to blame persecuting the talented leaders and thinkers who'd once been the democracy's lifeblood. A system that had harnessed the competitive instincts of the aristocrats for the benefit of the people had turned into a regime that drove Athens' finest into the hands of its enemies. Democracy was fatally wounded. Death squads roamed the streets. And in this climate of fear, the Athenians turned on Socrates. For over half a century, Socrates had roamed through Athens, goading the city like a gadfly with his interminable questions. And while the democracy was strong, the Athenians had viewed him with interest. It was a bit of an eccentric. But after the horrors of the last few years, he was viewed as a destabilizing influence that had to be permanently eradicated. Socrates was brought to trial on two counts, for mocking the gods the city believed in and for corrupting its youth. A couple of Socrates' former pupils turned out to be traitors and anti-democrats, and so they saddled Socrates with the responsibility for that. The Athenians always believed that people should be held responsible for whatever views they expressed. The accusations were put to him in the Agora, where he was summoned to appear before the chief magistrate. The quarter is now severed by the Athens metro. <laughs> 
that according to Plato, Socrates says he has to stop taking part in the dialogues because he has to go to this building here in order to answer the charge. John Camp's been excavating the Agora for nearly 40 years. How would it have been organized here and who, who would have been involved? Well, well, the Athenians are very litigious people, so the courts would have met frequently, and there were lots of them. And they took huge manpower because the smallest Athenian jury is 201, 501 is common, 1,501 if they really wanted to. It was very loud and very noisy and very crowded all the time. The trial of Socrates was a most extraordinary occasion. Socrates was utterly uncompromising. The thing I'm not going to do, he says, is to give up philosophizing, to give up talking to people, asking people what it is um, that they believe in. Clearly, there was quite a lot of heckling. Plato reports that Socrates scorned his accusers. They fall back on the stock charges against any seeker of wisdom, that he teaches his pupils about things in the heavens and below the earth, to disbelieve in the gods, and to make the weaker argument defeat the stronger. They would be very loath, I fancy, to admit the truth, which is that they are pretending to knowledge when, in fact, they are entirely ignorant. He refused throughout to respect the court, asked to suggest a punishment when the jurors might well have accepted exile. He answered, free meals for life the traditional reward for sporting heroes. He'd always told them the truth, what was good for them, and therefore they ought to thank him. And that's not quite how they saw it. And so when he suggested he should be treated as the equivalent of an Olympic victor, which was the most heroic human being around, that didn't go down well. As it was, more jurors voted, yes, he should be executed, than had voted, yes, he's guilty. Some changed their minds, in other words. Plato tells us that Socrates made sure he had the final word. The hour of departure has arrived, and we both go our own ways. I to die, and you to live, which is better. God only knows. It may have been here that Socrates spent his last days, in the small prison in the Athenian Agora. On the allotted day, he drank hemlock from a tiny cup. He walked around until his legs grew heavy. He lay down on his bed. Plato was clearly moved. This was the end of our comrade, a man who was best, wisest, and most just of all. But death by hemlock was agonizing. Socrates would have been consumed by pain, vomiting and diarrhea. Almost immediately, the Athenians regretted what they'd done. They voted to erect a statue of Socrates just outside the city walls. And Plato, his pupil, would go on to write him into history as the world's first ideological martyr, a martyr to liberty and freedom of speech. He told the Athenians they did, things they didn't want to hear about themselves, um, and he refused to make any concessions. Um, that's, of course, one of the reasons he's so admirable, uh, but also one of the reasons he was executed. Socrates was seen as the educator of tyrants. It would be better to think of him, perhaps, in those terms as somebody giving a hate speech in a mosque. Would we allow free speech under such terms? Teachers have responsibility. They should live up to the responsibility. And Socrates certainly was productive of some of the most dangerous men in Athens in the fifth and fourth century. And one should never forget that his most important pupil, Plato, was the theorist to whom Stalin turned and Hitler turned in order to justify their totalitarian state. There is something of a blackness in that philosophy. Socrates questioned the wisdom of mass rule. He allied himself to the gung-ho conservative aristocrats. He was, in many ways, anti-democratic. 
But at the same time, his questions liberated mankind. He was a pioneer in a movement which had begun to reach beyond the confines of religion and ask questions about how the world was made and what the role of humans was within that world. Democracy could tolerate many things, but not a direct challenge to democracy itself. By questioning the gods, Socrates had undermined the shared value system upon which Democratia depended. The paradox is that these radical ideas developed precisely because Athenian democracy allowed free speech. Direct Athenian democracy only lasted for 150 years. Although we uphold it as the pillar of our civilization, in fact, the West has spent much of its history rejecting it as a political model. The story of Athens goes part of the way to explain why. Democracy is hard work. It is demanding and flawed and volatile. For three generations, Athens had been phenomenally successful. The citizens of the polis had lived through one of the most radical and innovative histories of the world. Yes, it was fickle and inconsistent and sometimes vindictive, but we have to admit to ourselves that those are the hallmarks of an open society. If you empower people, you sign up to a life of uncertainty and change. And nowhere demonstrates that better than the bloody and brilliant place that was democratic Athens.